Uh, good evening. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Jason Brandeis. I'm an assistant professor here in the Justice Center at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and I would like to welcome you all to tonight's event, Time to Legalize, a public discussion on marijuana law and policy. Uh, before we get started with the event, I wanted to make a few comments and address why we are holding this event tonight and to explain a little bit of the format to you. You should know that this event is sponsored by the University of Alaska Anchorage Justice Center and the Student-Led Justice Club. This is part of a series of events that are part of National Criminal Justice Month. National, National Criminal Justice Month uh, is a, a special month. <laughs> Um, it is, uh, in 2009, Congress uh, created this month as a way to promote discussion of important criminal justice issues. And since then, we have been putting on events that are intended to invite the public and the UAA community to get a better understanding of contentious and serious criminal justice matters. Um, and this topic, marijuana legalization, certainly falls within that category. There is vibrant nationwide debate over marijuana legalization. Um, for the first time, well, for the first time since Gallup has been polling on this issue, for the first time, public opinion polls indicate that the majority of Americans support marijuana legalization. Recently, voters in Colorado and Washington state legalized recreational use of marijuana and legalized the retail sale of marijuana. And in response, the federal government has shifted its enforcement policies in order to allow the experiments in these states to continue. And soon, voters in other states will be asked about whether or not marijuana should be legalized in their states as well. In fact, just last week, it was officially announced that a marijuana legalization question will be on the ballot in Alaska on the primary election ballot in August. So given these recent dramatic changes in the law and in the public debate on this issue, we felt that the time was right for everyone to learn more about legalization. So we invited some experts up here to talk with us about it tonight. When it came time to come up with a name for this event, um, I made the mistake of asking some of my friends and colleagues for ideas. Uh, it's not hard to imagine the slate of marijuana pun-related titles that they suggested. Um, I'll share a couple of them with you. Um, high time to legalize marijuana? Puff puff pass a marijuana legalization law? Uh, doobie or not doobie? That is the marijuana question. And there were a number of suggestions about whether it would be serving food and if brownies would be the appropriate food of choice. Um, and I found this, I found this really interesting because the people that I asked are people that are usually very serious about law and policy issues, and they just could not resist the opportunity to make a marijuana joke. And the problem with these jokes and, and the prevalence of jokes and puns about marijuana legalization is that the problem is that marijuana legalization is a serious subject and a serious public policy issue. It involves public health considerations, personal medical decisions, addiction and recovery, legal matters, criminal justice policies, racial inequalities, economic issues, matters of personal privacy and autonomy, and the relationship between the state and the federal government, something that you know we Alaskans love to talk about. So we settled on the title, Time to Legalize, a public discussion on marijuana law and policy, because that is exactly what we want this event to be. We want it to be a serious discussion where we can address an important social policy question and allow us to address it in more than just five to 10 second sound bites. So the format for this event is um, maybe not what you, what you were expecting. Um, this is not going to be a cable news, talking heads, yelling at each other event, nor is this going to be a formal traditional debate. Uh, that is, we're not going to hear from one side for three minutes and then hear from the other side for three minutes and then have a 60-second rebuttal and then a 30-second counter rebuttal. And there are a few reasons for that. But the main reason is that there are more than just two sides to this issue and more than just two sides to this debate. We have five presenters and panelists with us here tonight, and they all have very different backgrounds. Um, they have very different experiences with the war on drugs. They work for very different organizations, and they each have a very unique perspective to share, and we want to hear from all of them tonight. 
First, we are going to hear some opening remarks um, from Ethan Nadelman, who I will introduce in just a moment. And following Ethan's remarks, we will have a panel discussion and a public Q&A. At that point, I will introduce the rest of the panel, and um, I'll have a few questions to ask them right off the bat to get the discussion started, and then we are gonna ask the panelists to respond to your questions. So if you have questions, we are asking you to please submit them in writing. We have given you some note cards, and there are some pens and pencils floating around, so please write your questions down and then pass them to the end of your row. We have some student volunteers here tonight who will come by and pick up the questions from you. Then they'll be transferred up to the stage where my colleague, Dr. Troy Payne, Dr. Troy Payne is here not just to look good, he is here to try to organize the questions into some coherent themes and then he will uh, give them to me and I will do my best to make sure that all of the questions are asked and answered, that the conversation moves along and that the panelists have a chance to express all of their views. But there's another option to submit a question. If you're not a fan of the old school pencil and paper approach, you can also tweet questions. Um, you can tweet questions to at UAAJC, that stands for UAA Justice Center, or you can tweet questions using the hashtag AKPOT, hashtag AKPOT, A-K-P-O-T. Um, so tweet away if you feel so desired, but please mute your device and dim the screen. Uh, Dr. Payne will then receive uh, the questions that are tweeted and um, he will share them with me, and if time permits, he will engage in a back and forth with you on Twitter as well. Um, and while we're talking about phones and mobile devices, even if you are not going to be using Twitter to send in questions tonight, we ask you to please um, silence your phone and um, make sure that it doesn't go off during the presentation. Okay, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Ethan Nadelman. Uh, Ethan is the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, the leading organization in um, in the United States promoting alternatives to the war on drugs. Ethan has a very um, impressive and extensive background and you can read all about his background as well as the other panelists on the, on the bio sheets that we handed out. Um, so I just want to mention a couple of things about Ethan. In addition to his writings being featured uh, being prominently featured in many uh, media outlets, including uh, Rolling Stone magazine. Ethan does a lot of media appearances, and the thing that has impressed me most about Ethan is that I've seen him on the Colbert, several, Colbert Report several times, and he manages to hold his own with Stephen Colbert um, very, very easily. So that was always very impressive. Uh, Ethan is a very prominent figure in the drug policy world, and we are very pleased that he was able to travel from his home in New York to join us here in Alaska to be part of this event. So please join me in welcoming Ethan Nadelman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, and uh, I, I just have to, it's so nice to come to snowy and balmy Anchorage from bitter cold and snowy New York City. So thank you for this warm weather. Um, you know, Jason asked me to talk not just about the marijuana issue, but the broader issue of drug policy and drug policy reform. And so that's what I'll focus on the marijuana thing because that's the, the, the theme of the night. But just to put it in some broader context. But first, I just want to get a, a sense of, of your all, where you're all coming from here. I mean, first of all, if somebody, how many of you in the audience um, over the age of 17 have never smoked marijuana? Raise your hands. Okay. So, 20%? Okay. Um, how many of you, actually, for this one, could everybody please close your eyes? Close your eyes, close your eyes. How many of you ever used an illegal drug? I don't, I see a lot of eyes open. Close your eyes, I don't want anybody watching. How many of you have ever tried cocaine? Raise your hands. Okay, put them down. How many of you ever tried MDMA, ecstasy? Raise your hands. Okay, how many ever done uh, any hallucinogens? Raise your hand. How many ever done meth? Raise your hand. Ooh, ooh. Okay, um, how many of you have family members who have struggled with addiction? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is a group that has a lot of experience with drugs, illegal drugs, and also a lot of experience knowing the problems of drugs and with addiction. Let me ask you this too. How many of you think we should legalize marijuana and plan to vote for this initiative? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are certain you're gonna vote against it? Raise your hand. 
And how many of you aren't sure? Raise your hand. Okay, so it looks like it's about 70% in favor, 15, undecided, 15. So what I'm going to do is I'm not, I'm going to speak primarily, those of you already decided you're voting against it, okay, fine, don't vote. Um, for for the, the, the rest of you, what I'm going to aim to do really is to talk, mo since the majority of you are here, people already plan on voting, I'm not going to tell you why you should do what you're already going to do. I'm going to try to put this in a broader context, and I'm going to try to push your thinking on the broader drug war issues, because I think that's really what this is really part of. I should say that what I have devoted my life to, you know, for decades and for decades hopefully to come, is ending the war on drugs. I just basically think the war on drugs is a total disaster in this country and around the world, right? I think, it, I think it, it, co it has cost this country a fortune. It has poured money down a rat hole of waste and criminal justice and military approaches that do not deliver. It has violated our fundamental civil liberties and human rights. It has, it has distorted and perverted American foreign policy and alienated our relations around the world. It has caused all sorts of empowerment, gross empowerment of the criminal justice establishment and the prison industrial complex in ways that do not conform with fundamental American values, right? It has basically assumed that adults in this country should be treated like infants and treated as if the state has to be the paternalistic authority telling us how to be. It's created lying and deception among parents and young people about how we even talk about the realities of marijuana and drugs like this. The racism of the war on drugs, maybe not a big issue up here in Alaska, but if you look at who's going to prison in American jails and prisons, not because black and brown people are disproportionately involved with drugs, but because they are disproportionately getting arrested and incarcerated, all of this is horrible. It's horrible, and it's time for it to change, and the country is really beginning to change, right? Now, another quick question I'm kind of curious about. How many of you actually think we should legalize all drugs? Raise your hand. And how many of you think that would be a terrible idea? Raise your hand. And how many of you aren't sure? Raise your hand. Okay, and I'm kind of in that aren't sure group as well. I mean, uh, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I think so. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'm against it. You know, and Sundays, I'm agnostic. Right, on this, this thing. But, what I, but I think it's important to understand that what we're trying to do here is to embrace a different way of living with the reality of drugs in our society. Because I start off with this assumption. I start off with the assumption that drugs are here to stay. Right? That there has virtually never been a drug-free society in human history. Although I understand that some of the is it Native Alaskans or Alaskan Natives? Who, who are the indigenous people here? There may have been not much drug use years ago because you couldn't grow anything up there. But I mean, apart from that, right, that essentially there has been drugs in virtually every society throughout human history, psychoactive drugs, right, being grown, discovered, devised, all sorts of things. And the same is going to be true in the future. If anything, there's going to be more and a greater variety of psychoactive drugs in the future, right? We're going to go in the future, whether we legalize or not, and we're going to see, you know, ecstasy generation four, and, 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 and Ritalin Generation 7, and Viagra Generation 12, and combination drugs of all these things. And I mean, that's where we're headed, right? There's not going to be fewer drugs or less diverse drugs. That's the fact of the matter, whether we like it or not. So this notion of creating a drug-free society, give me a break already. Drug-free society when there's never been such a thing in society? Nancy Reagan's drugs-free, all this sort of stuff? No evidence to support that idea. And for those people who say, but shouldn't we at least try to get closer and closer to a drug-free society? Isn't that a good objective to pursue? I say, at what cost? Are we going to pursue some, some objective, some totalitarian, absolutist objective, and we're going to be willing to pay any price and bear any burden and lock up a zillion people and spend a trillion dollars just to get that much closer? No, I don't think so. I think the real challenge is, how do we take a deep breath Accept the fact that drugs are here to stay, whether we like it or not, and that ultimately our challenge as a society, as parents, as children, as, as people who vote, our challenge is to accept that reality and to learn how to live with that reality, learn how to live with drugs so they cause the least possible harm, and in some cases, the greatest possible benefit. That's the challenge. That's the decent way to deal with it. That's the adult way to deal with this reality, right? That's it. 
How do we reduce the death, disease, crime, and suffering associated with drugs on the one hand? And how do we reduce all the horrors of drug prohibition and our failed prohibitionist policies on the other? I mean, alcohol prohibition is so appropriate here, right? America became one of the few countries in the Western world to say, let's criminalize booze back in the teens, right? And we had national amendment, changed the Constitution. And what happened? The first few years, alcohol consumption went down. Everybody thought, oh, this could work. And then after a few years, what happened? People started drinking again. But instead of getting it from legal manufacturers and producers, it was Al Capone and organized crime and then all the violence and corruption, overflowing jails and prison cells and, and the bootleggers and young people looking up to bootleggers as role models and people dying and being blinded and poisoned by bad bootleg liquor, liquor that was more dangerous because it was illegal. And at some point, people just said enough already. This is ridiculous. Let's repeal that alcohol prohibition law and let's replace it with a responsible approach to regulation of alcohol and do the best we can with a drug, by the way, alcohol, that by almost any measure and any scientific consensus is as dangerous or more dangerous than virtually all other drugs that are currently illegal, right? Well, you see the analogy with the drug wars today. Right? We know that drugs can be deadly. Even marijuana can be addictive, problematic, right? It's not a benign substance. Most people can use it relatively responsibly, but some people don't. We know the other drugs can be even harder to control. But ultimately, we also know that making it illegal, this failed prohibitionist policy, has resulted in America as being the leading nation for incarceration in the world. You know, the, you know these numbers? The United States, less than 5% of the world's population but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We rank first in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. We lock up more people for violating the drug law, nonviolent offense, than all of Western Europe locks up for everything. And they got 100 million more people than we do. No, that's not the right way to go. So here's the way I think about this. I think Imagine all the options for dealing with drugs arrayed along a spectrum, right? So at one end, you have the most punitive, cut off their heads, pull out their fingernails, Singapore, Saudi Arabia model, right? Pick up people off the streets, drug test them without cause, throw them into so-called treatment camps. And then all the way at the other end, you have the free market model. Right? Virtually no controls except maybe on sale to children. Uh, Milton Friedman's wet dream for shorthand. Right? I mean, that what cigarette policy was in the 60s. Right? Now the question becomes, can we and should we move down this spectrum? And if so, how far? Right? When we think about the issue, why not legalize all drugs, people say, well, no, because we don't know. First of all, it's not politically realistic. Apart from marijuana, nobody's really serious about making that happen, a very small percentage of people, right? And we don't know what the consequences would be of making heroin or cocaine available like alcohol or cigarettes or people are going to do with marijuana now, right? But if you ask yourself, why is the drug issue a criminal justice issue? Why, why, when we talk about drugs, is it always cops and prosecutors front and center? Why, when we hire a drug czar, do they always come from the military, or the police, or, a, or they hire a professional moralist, right? Why are they hiring somebody from the health world? When they have meetings about what to deal with, do with the drug problem in Alaska, why is, aren't those meetings chaired by leading health officials rather than law enforcement officials? Why? When you're dealing with other crimes, rape, murder, theft, you know, you got the Ten Commandments, you got the Code of Hammurabi. Those things are illegal throughout history across societies. We understand why we have police and courts and prosecutors and prisons to punish people who do that stuff. But this notion that here we have these psychoactive substances that some people use, and so most people use responsibly, some people don't, that we're going to treat that as a criminal matter? Eh. I mean, also, does anybody here actually believe when you look at the question, why do we have alcohol and tobacco legal and these other drugs illegal? Does anybody think that that was a result of a commission of wise men, a National Academy of Science 100 years ago, basically sitting down and going, well, you know, alcohol and tobacco, those things are not so dangerous. Let's make them legal. And these ones, well, they're really dangerous, dangerous. Let's make them illegal. Does anybody believe that's what happened? No. Of course that's not what happened. 
If you ask the question, how and why was it that these drugs landed up legal and these drugs landed up illegal, you know what the answer is, the number one answer? I mean, history is complicated, but the number one answer? That distinction had everything to do with who used these drugs and who was perceived to use these drugs. In the 1870s, when most of the consumers of opiate drugs in America were middle-class white women, using them as their general medication for menopause and aches and pains and diarrhea and everything else, nobody talked about making it illegal because nobody wanted to put auntie or grandma behind bars, right? But when the Chinese started coming and bringing that habit of smoking opium and working 100 hours a week and going back home and smoking a little opium, and then people started getting scared, what were those Chinamen going to do to our precious white women and addicting and seducing them into opium dens and opium slaves? That's when you got the first criminal laws. First cocaine prohibition laws. What were those? About black people in the South putting that white powder up their black noses and white people freaking out about what the black people were going to do to the precious white women. That's when you got the first criminal prohibitions, right? Until then, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it, and so far as we know, there was no major Coca-Cola addiction problem in the 1890s. Marijuana, marijuana, what was that about? The first marijuana prohibition laws in the Midwest and the Southwest, Southwest and the Far West, right? Directed at Mexican-Americans, Mexican migrants, coming up, taking good jobs from the good white people, going back home at night, smoking up a little reefer, you know, a cucaracha, you know, right, right? And all the fear, what about those little Mexicans? What were they gonna do when they smoked that reefer stuff to our precious women and children? Understand that for those of you who think that these laws deserve our respect, well, they've been put there through a democratic process, yes, but they are grounded in bigotry and prejudice and ignorance. And that's why it's time to change these things as much as possible. Now, here's what we know. When we move down this spectrum, when we move down this spectrum of how to deal with drugs, what we know is that all of the incremental steps, welcome. <laughs> You've seized everybody's attention. We know that all of these steps towards ending the criminalization of drug possession towards treating addiction as a health issue, towards reducing criminal sentences, towards decriminalization, toward all of this, present no risks in terms of increased drug use or crime and substantial benefits. And what we know as well with marijuana is that when you decriminalize the possession of it, you don't result in an increase. All the comparative evidence from around the world says that when you decriminalize and stop putting people in jail for marijuana possession, it does not lead to more users. It just leads to fewer arrests and that. But now we get to this issue of taking marijuana, marijuana, not the other drugs here, but marijuana out of the criminal justice system. Are there risks associated with it? I think so. Is there a risk that marijuana use, the number of marijuana users would go up? I think so. Should we proceed in this direction anyway? Damn right. Why? Half the drug arrests in America were for marijuana last year, marijuana possession. I think in Alaska just a couple years ago, it was like 70 or 80% of all the drug arrests, even though it's decriminalized here, right? You know that you say, people say marijuana is practically legal and, or is effectively legal in Alaska. It's not effectively legal when people, when you still have the DEA and your state enforcement agents busting people for growing weed. It's not legal when people are still engaging in illegal transactions and people are still getting killed in the process. It's not legal when there's nobody regulating the quality of the product that's being available on the streets. It's not legal when people who are criminal and sometimes organized criminals are basically collecting the quote unquote tax revenue instead of the government getting this and pouring it into things like they're doing in Washington, Colorado now as for schools, right? It's not legal when people are essentially getting fired from their jobs, not because they were high on the job, but because of something they did in the privacy of their own home over the weekend, showed up totally straight and responsible on a Monday morning and got drug tested and got fired for that, right? That's what we're talking about here. It's not legal when people end up spending a night in jail. That may be nothing unless you end up getting brutalized or traumatized when you're jailed. It's not legal when Mexican gangsters are making billions of dollars a year by growing this stuff and selling this stuff and sending you know, people to grow, grow this stuff in national forests around the United States. 
It's not legal when you have 50 to 100,000 people behind bars tonight for a marijuana offense. Now, what's happened in the United States is that people have begun to wise up. They've begun to say, it's time to end this madness. That's why you now have a majority of people, according to every public opinion poll in this state and a growing number of states around the country and around the country and nationally saying, end marijuana prohibition. Stop arresting people. Take it out of the underground market. Part of it is, I mean, I'll tell you, when we look at the public opinion polls and we look at the people who are in the middle on this thing, you know the two arguments that most appeal to people who are ambivalent about legalization? The first one is the belief that they want the cops focusing on real crime, not busting people for weed. That's the first one. And the second one is the view that they'd rather have the government taxing it and regulating it and spending the money on school construction or drug treatment or whatever than having criminals profiting from this, especially Mexican gangsters and all this sort of thing. Those are the two major arguments. Whenever there's a journalist who calls the work that I do or these votes for legalization pro-pot, they get a phone call from me. And I say to them, we're not pro-pot, that's bullshit. The fact of the matter is the large majority of people today who are voting to legalize marijuana don't use marijuana, and many of them don't like marijuana, right? They don't. The, the small percentage of Americans who enjoy their marijuana, or used to enjoy their marijuana, most of them are voting to legalize, but they're not the majority of the people who are voting to legalize. What I've been telling my allies for many years is we don't win. Marijuana doesn't get removed from the criminal justice system until the majority of parents of teenagers believe that making marijuana legal is going to better protect their children, our children, than is the current policy. And that's what people are becoming persuaded of right now. Now, some people say, well, won't legalizing marijuana lead to a jump in adolescent marijuana use? And I say, no. You know why? First of all, the law is not going to change anything for under the age of 21. And let's be clear about that. But secondly, when you Ask the question, who's got the best access to marijuana in America today? What's the answer? Teenagers. Who had the best access 10 years ago? Teenagers. 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Teenagers. Who's going to have the best access 10 years or 20 years from now? Teenagers. There are three national surveys over the last 10 years in which teenagers say it's easier to buy marijuana than it is to buy alcohol. Right? 80% of all 17-year-olds say if they want to get marijuana, they know how to get it quickly. Basically, all teenagers who have any interest could get it if they want, right? So the notion that somehow keeping it illegal for adults is protecting the kids, when the adults say that the kids, what have you been smoking, parent? I mean, how can you be so silly and irrational as to ultimately believe that, right? I mean, there's an issue, the price may come down and that may affect it, but availability? You know who I think is going to smoke more marijuana if it gets legal? I think it's going to be people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, 80s, and especially in their 90s, right? It's going to be people saying, you know, I prefer a little puff at the night, a little bite on that marijuana pretzel uh, to that sleeping pill. You know, I found I prefer it to having that drink or two at the end of the night. You know, it helps with my arthritis and my aches and pains and my, my restless foot syndrome and my diabetes. Um, I mean, it's going to be this quasi-medical type of use. And I can tell you already anecdotally, that's what I'm hearing all over the country, sometimes from people in their 60s or 70s who never smoked marijuana before. Sometimes they haven't smoked in 30 or 40 years. And that's what they're saying. Right? I don't think they're going to be smoking joints or, 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 or uh, bongs anymore either. I think it's going to be basically people vaping, you know, kind of e-cigarette types of consumption of marijuana, right? Or it's going to be more edible products. One reason I think we need to legalize marijuana is, you know what I worry about? Edibles. Marijuana edibles, you know, eating cookies and brownies and lozenges and all these sorts of things. The thing is, when you smoke marijuana, you take a puff, you know, you can tell if you're high in a few minutes or two. You can titrate your dose. People flip out and say, oh, this new marijuana is so much more potent. Let me tell you something. I've been smoking marijuana a long time ago, and there was good one-hit shit back then, too, right? <laughs> There's more of it around now, but i got to tell you something. You can titrate your dose, and you learn if the stuff's really strong, just take it one puff. Don't smoke the whole damn thing. But when you're doing edibles, I want to know what the percent THC is in there. I want to know the product. I want somebody regulating the quality of that stuff so we know what's going on, right? 
People say, well, what about, I mean, Alaska? You got a terror. How much time, more time do I have? Uh, probably about time to. Okay. <laughs> Just getting going here. Damn. People, people say, you know, you in Alaska especially got a terrible problem with booze, right? People say, you're going to pile on another problem with marijuana? First of all, look, marijuana does not compare to alcohol and danger. There's nothing like fetal alcohol syndrome with marijuana or these other sorts of things. Let's be clear about that, right? I don't see any way in which making marijuana legal is going to increase alcohol abuse or problems like that. If anything, which you may see is some people switching from alcohol to marijuana both responsible marijuana use, people re shifting responsible alcohol use, responsible marijuana use, as well as people who've been addicted switching over there. I think that's going to be the principal thing. So in the end, is any, when you guys vote, as I think you're going to do in August, to legalize marijuana and to become the third state in the country to do so, is things going to change dramatically in Alaska? No. You're going to take a fairly small industry and you're going to move it from the underground to the above ground. You're going to start taxing it a bit. You're going to start regulating it a bit. The hypocrisy in drug education, all these other discussions, is going to be diminished, right? Fewer people are going to get criminal records. There's not going to be any great increase in marijuana use. What you will have achieved when you do this is the rationalization of dealing with marijuana in your state. I know here, I understand that you talk here about the lower 48. In Washington and Colorado, they also talk about the lower 48. But in their view, the lower 48 are the states who have yet to legalize marijuana. <laughs> you don't want to stay in the lower 48. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ethan. That was very interesting, and there's go there is, I'm sure, a lot of fodder for discussion. Um, I'd like to take a few moments and introduce the panel. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, seated right next to Ethan. This is Taylor Bickford. Uh, Taylor works for the Alaska office of a national strategic communications firm and he serves as an advisor and spokesperson for the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol in Alaska. Seated next to Taylor is Sher Sheriff Lance Buckholtz. And Lance, I, I don't know where to begin with your background. Um, Lance, is, <laughs> Lance is a retired law enforcement official. He is also a fifth generation farmer. He is an ordained minister and a beekeeper. Um, Lance is here on behalf of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And, and Lance, I'm just going to ask you really quickly if you can give us the real quick 30-second elevator pitch summary of what LEAP is and what LEAP does. Uh, LEAP stands for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And what we stand for is the end of this ridiculous war on drugs and the end to prohibition, it isn't working, it's never worked, and it's time for it to end. That's the whole point of LEAP, and it's police officers, uh, judges, prosecutors, uh, sheriffs, corrections officer, border patrol agents, DEA agents, it's a national organization, and we feel it's just time for law enforcement officers to stand up and say it's time for this prohibition to end. Thank you, Lance. Uh, seated next to Lance is Dean Guanelli. Dean is the former Chief Assistant Attorney General for the criminal section of the Alaska Department of Law. Uh, Dean had a very long and distinguished 30-year career as an attorney. Um, he has since um, shifted gears and he's now an artist. Um, and if the, I know there are some lawyers in the room here tonight and if you are practicing law in Alaska, you may have worked for Dean or worked with Dean or as the moderator for this panel has worked opposite Dean on several cases. Um, but if you have encountered Dean in your professional career, um, you know that he is a, a very talented attorney and worked on a number of precedent setting cases in Alaska and helped to draft a very significant pieces of legislation. And we're very, um, very pleased that he was able to come up from Juneau to join us here tonight. 
Seated next to Dean is Ben Court. Um, and I guess Ben is essentially the anti-Ethan um, here, here tonight, for lack of a better term. Uh, ben is here on behalf of Project SAM. SAM stands for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Um, and ben um, has a very interesting background. Ben has been part of the recovery community in almost every way imaginable, as a recipient, as a provider, and a spokesperson. Um, he's on the board of directors of Project Sam, but he's also a junior fellow at the University of Florida's Drug Policy Institute. He serves on the board of directors for the Denver-based Stout Street Foundation, and he leads the business development team for CEDAR, which is a world-class uh, treatment center for residential addiction and co-occurring disorders in Aurora, Colorado. And I thought that a good way to get the, the um, discussion started tonight would be to give Ben um, a little bit of time to respond to some of the, the questions or some of the, the points that Ethan raised. I saw him furiously taking notes. So Ben, why don't you take a few minutes and, and kind of give, tell us a little bit about um, what Project SAM is doing, what SAM's view is on marijuana legalization, and otherwise respond to Ethan's comments. I'll leave the... Uh description of what SAM is up to you guys. Go ahead and take a look at the website. It's learnaboutsam.org if you're interested. Basically, it's a um, science-informed uh, national organization, international now, actually. We just launched a Canada branch that believes pretty firmly that um, science should be at the core of all of these policy decisions. We reject the uh, false dichotomy that it's either lock them up or legalize it. And um, I think it's a little bit more thoughtful approach. It's why I joined them, because I think that this conversation far too often gets boiled down into quick little things that fit on a bumper sticker. And the reality is, is that this is complex, it's nuanced, it's interesting. Um, it's a very fascinating conversation to be a part of. And I'll, I'll tell you guys how I got into it in a minute. Um, but first of all, let me address the potential perception of somebody coming um, to your state to tell you about your ballot initiative. Um, I'm from Colorado, and I actually um, quit my job, the, the nonprofit that I helped to start that got folks in recovery or trying to get into recovery, that got them outside and got them uh, climbing and biking and camping and hiking and fishing, and, and it was great. It was fun. I loved it. I, I left when we had about 30 people working for us um, and about 10,000 people doing activities with us. It was all free, of course. It was a nonprofit. I left so that I could get involved on the formal No on 64 campaign, which was our constitutional amendment that legalized recreational marijuana. And um, when I started taking part in these debates, one of the things that really irked me was when the guys from out of town would come and tell me what I was supposed to do. And so I want to address that kind of head on with you guys um, and tell you, first off, that's not my intention. Um, your state has a very, very special spot in my heart. Two years, um, I got sober in 1996, and two years after that, um, after driving for, for about four months, found my way up here and um, spent, uh, boy, almost six weeks driving around, hitchhiking around, um, and just absolutely fell in love with this place. I have seen, um, I don't think I'd ever really seen the, the, the beauty that America's got to offer until I spent the time I did in Alaska. This is a special place and somewhere where I really hope to, to end up one day. Um, but so when people would come in and, and tell me what I needed to know, I felt like it was always a little bit um, their perspective, my state, my consequences kind of thing. So I'm not here to tell you what I think that you guys should do at all. I'm here to tell you what happened in Colorado and what is happening in Colorado, stop. You guys know the old adage um, that a smart man learns from his mistakes and a wise man from the mistakes of others. Um, this is no longer theoretical. This is no longer a what if. This has happened in Colorado. This will happen in Washington soon. So we now get to be the test case. You know, people continually refer to us as, as an experiment. And um, boy, whether it's the whether it's the president or the news anchor or the whatever it is, it, it always gets my blood boiling a little bit because the fact of the matter is, is is that you don't experiment on people who didn't sign up to be experimented on. You don't experiment on kids. You don't experiment on a mass uh, group of folks who, who don't have any say in, in what's, what they're being poked and prodded with. I'm the father of three kids in public school in Colorado. I, I resent the idea that our state is being used as this massive experiment but if it must be, then let me tell you guys what's going on. Um, 
and we're going to get to that. I think we've got plenty of time for it. What's happening in Colorado is not what we signed up for. The quick sound bite, the short little legalize it, go, go, rah, rah, tax, regulate, like alcohol. That's not what happened. What happened, and what I urge you guys to do, and, and God, one of the reasons why I love this place so much is the, um, you guys are thinkers, um, and what I urge you guys to do here is to really question some of the short taglines that you hear around this. This is a complex problem, and you are not simply legalizing a substance. We can talk all day about how incredibly uh, flexible the laws are here in Alaska and how basically the only thing that you can't do is sell marijuana back and forth and drive it around. You can grow it and you can consume it so long as you're in your house. From what I understand, Dean can tell us more about that later. What this is, is this is the industrialization of marijuana. That is what's happened in Colorado and that is what the goal of this is here in Alaska. It's not about letting you guys get high. Get high. I don't care if you get high. Listen, I'm a recovering drug addict. So far as I know, I'm the only recovering drug addict who's here. I'm the last person who's going to start casting stones. Go. Fine. Don't drive. Don't let my kids see. I don't care. Not about demonizing a substance. Absolutely not. Not about defending laws that don't make sense. Absolutely not. I'm here to tell you that this legislation, read it. Read it in its entirety. In its entirety. Um, specifically protecting, it, what, you need eight pages to get all of this done because it's about protecting those commercial interests. This is a big giant sign, welcome to Alaska, industrialized marijuana, big marijuana, whatever in the world you want to call it. This has happened in Colorado. We've got two companies that say they'll be doing a billion dollars in commerce inside of Colorado this year, Open Vape and Dixie Elixirs. That's not little uh, you and me fighting the man sort of stuff. That's the big business. That's the big power. And to address what I'm sure is going to come up really quickly, um, the rehab program that I work for, because I can't get away from it. I love it too much. It's my heart. I, um, I got to be with the folks who, who are at that place where they need the help. It's a nonprofit. It's a hospital-based. And not only would we never accept anyone who was forced into treatment, I am absolutely philosophically opposed to the idea of forcing anyone into treatment. What I believe in is making sure that we create and maintain a society that um, does not overly, uh, o that, that, that doesn't allow drugs to become marijuana, to become totally normalized to a younger generation, then lead to further issues that, that come along with that. So tonight I'm going to talk specifically about the law that you guys are facing in Alaska. I've read it, read it, understand it, and know it's not legalization. This is an effort at industrialization of marijuana in, in your home state, like they did in mine. Thank you, Ben. Um, before before um, I, I kick some of those points that you raised to the other panelists, I wanted to give um, Dean an opportunity to take off his um, ceramicist hat and put his lawyer hat, sorry, Dean, put his lawyer hat back on for a moment and um, tell, maybe just explain for those of you that are unfamiliar with some of the lingo, when we talk about legalization, what does that mean? What is the difference between legalizing marijuana and decriminalizing marijuana? And Dean, to the extent you can briefly address this, if you could sort of summarize maybe Alaska's unique marijuana privacy laws, I think that would, the audience would be appreciative of that background. <clears throat> Well, thanks, Jason, for, for that task. Um, as, as, as Ben says, it's, it's not uh, an easy subject, and in Alaska, it, it hasn't been easy for many, many years. But to answer the first question, a, a, a crime is simply something that legislature, society has declared um, that society condemns and condemns in such a way that you could go to jail for doing it. When you decriminalize something, it means that conduct no longer is a crime. It's no longer something you can go to jail for. Now you can decriminalize it to the point where there's no penalty associated with it, or you can decriminalize it to the point where you can't go to jail for it, you can just be fined. Um, and in this, in the, uh, in the initiative, the, I think the, uh, the 
part about uh, public display using using marijuana in public uh, is decriminalized because it would no longer be a crime, but it isn't made completely legal because you can still be fined for doing that. Uh, and so these these little nuances are are important to to lawyers. Um, I I don't know uh, how much of this really. Um, is, is all that relevant to um, the main points that I think we want to discuss in any policy discussion. I think that uh, if you look at the initiative, what, what Ben Court says about it is accurate. It is, um, it is decriminalizing and actually making completely legal the retail selling of marijuana and the commercialization of marijuana. That's what this does. That's the main um, point of this. It would regulate it, trying to regulate it like alcohol. Um, in my view, we don't do a terribly good job uh, dealing with it, uh, dealing with it, dealing with alcohol. But um, there's certainly one aspect of, of the initiative that I think is, um, you know, is an important thing to take into consideration, and that's, and we can talk about it later if someone wants to ask me about it, but its effect on on rural Alaska, on native Alaskans, and, uh, and allowing marijuana to uh, get into the rural villages more than it does right now. So um, that's, my, that's my thumbnail sketch of decriminalization and legalization. Thank you, Dean. Well, um, we've got a lot of questions that have come in that have come in from the audience, and we're going to try to get uh, to all of them tonight. Um, before uh, there, and there are some very specific questions about the Alaska initiative. There are some questions about what's happening in Washington and Colorado, what the results and the social consequences of legalization has been so far in those states. Um, but before I, I get into your questions, I just want to ask Taylor to to comment on a point that 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 Ben brought up, and Ben. Um, so this is what stood out to me in the, in the comment that you made, and that is the fear of industrialized marijuana, um, or as I, I've read, as Ethan has described, that the Marlboroization of, of marijuana, or the, the big marijuana industry. And, and, and Taylor, maybe you can speak to um, you know, Ben's criticism of the initiative as being uh, something that is just favoring the industrial, industrialization of marijuana. Sure, thank you, Jason. Um, First off, I just want to say I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here for the campaign, uh, to have a presence on the panel, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be involved in um, such an important issue in this state. Um, I grew up in Alaska. I was born here. I went to high school in Alaska. I was married here. Uh, my wife and I have decided to raise our uh, three-month-old daughter here, and um, I have spent most of my life here, about 80 percent of it. Um, and Part of what I love about this state is this, the spirit that the state was built on. It's a spirit of uh, individualism, a uh, spirit of uh, liberty and personal responsibility. Uh, and those are principles that very much cut to the core of, of the marijuana issue. Um, and I think um, we, it looks to me like most people in this room recognize that um, we sort of lost sight of those principles um, when it comes to this issue. Um, so I think. Um, Clearly, there, there seems to be, um, from, from Mr. Guinali and Mr. Court, uh, some sort of demonization of free enterprise, economic development, um, and the idea that uh, an industry, $2 billion industry being set up in the state is somehow a bad thing. I, I would disagree very strongly with that. Um, what we know is happening now is that uh, marijuana is here. People are using it. We saw all the hands that were raised when uh, Ethan asked who's used it, who knows someone who's used it. And so that, that industry is already here. Uh, that money is already being spent. The difference is the money's being spent on the black market, and the money is entirely benefiting criminal organizations um, and is not being taxed by the state and is not benefiting the state in any way. It's benefiting criminals, drug dealers, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I don't buy the argument that passing this initiative will create the industry because the industry is already here. And what we're talking about doing is bringing it out of the underground and bringing it um, and regulating it in such a way that Alaskans can actually benefit from the commerce that's already taking place. Thank you, Taylor. One of the questions that keeps coming up in the 
in the, uh, in the responses that we're seeing here tonight, and I know something that's a big part of this debate, is the impact that marijuana legalization will have on people driving under the influence of marijuana. Um, and I, I want to um, maybe first address this question to Lance um, and to ask if you have any, um, as a former law enforcement official, um, if you have any, any thoughts or comments about people driving while stoned and what impact legalization will have on the rates or incidents of people driving um, after smoking marijuana. Sure. Well, uh, obviously I'm not going to sit here and condone anyone operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of any kind of intoxicant. I can only speak for Wisconsin law. I'm not trying to be some outsider who's you know, coming up here and telling you what to do. Uh, even though you don't have the officer sheriff in Alaska, I understand and appreciate that, which much to Ethan's chagrin makes me a big celebrity up here. Uh, if you want my autograph later, I'd be more than happy to stay. Uh, I did bring my horse and six shooter, and I do have a Stetson in the back room. Uh, as far as operating while intoxicated in Wisconsin, it's probably a little bit different, and I know it's different in Alaska from talking to some officers up here and that you have a different way you handle that. In Wisconsin, intoxicated is defined as operating with any intoxicated, with a, boy, that's a long term to use next to a couple attorneys. Um, <laughs> it, it's any substance in your blood that uh, would impair your ability to operate the motor vehicle. So we can, in Wisconsin, arrest you for operating while intoxicated. It does not have to be alcohol. It can be any substance like that. We do a blood screen, and if you have any marijuana in your system, you're going to get convicted of the uh, uh, operating while intoxicated. But we do a blood screen for, I believe we're up to 24 different substances right now. And when I say Wisconsin's a little different is you do have a right of refusal for the, uh, the test, for the, blood, for the blood draw. You go ahead and refuse, and that is then another charge. You get charged with a second offense, and guess what? We take the blood anyway. So when you're out there writing the ticket, you know, here's your ticket for OWI, you know, are you going to take the test or not? And they say, oh, I don't think I'm going to take the test. And you'll be sitting there going, oh, take the test, take the test. And everyone who comes in the room says, take the test. So it's a separate charge in Wisconsin. Right. Lance, can I just ask, does LEAP have an official uh, a position or um, an, uh, best practices or um, a, a, a suggestion for law enforcement personnel in how they might deal with a potential increase in people driving under the influence of marijuana? Well, I'm not so sure that you would see an increase. And I would just say that officers should just do their job. They're sworn to do a job. Uh, you take an oath of office. Uh, you need to get people out if you have probable cause to make a stop, and it's a reasonable stop. Make it. See what the offense is. I mean, I've stopped people for what I thought was uh, OWI on several occasions, and it turns out to be a medical issue. It turns out to be someone who worked a 20 hour shift. I mean, some ridiculously long shift and they're just exhausted. They aren't intoxicated. But you need that discretion as an officer. One of the things I'm concerned with and what brought me to LEAP was the militarization of law enforcement. Instead of being community caretakers, uh, when you have a drug war, you have to have warriors. And people are afraid to approach their local police nowadays. It seems, uh, you know, they've become, um, almost like an occupying, ar occupying army in their own communities. I think we need to draw the line here and get back to community policing, community-oriented policing. Well, that certainly raises some other issues that I hope we can get to a little bit later. Um, ben, do you have any, is there any data or any information coming out of Colorado that um, can, can give us some insight into whether we're seeing increases in people driving under the influence of marijuana? Yeah, I wish I had the numbers for Washington at my fingertips. I don't. I know Sam just uh, did a press release with it, though, because they were so much higher. So Colorado, in January alone, we had uh, 60 arrests for drug driving. And keeping in mind that the cops in Colorado have a real hard time um, 
arresting you for a drug to driving. They would much rather have it be another offense. If there's any alcohol, they're of course going to go that route because of how difficult it is to test and because of the inconsistencies with the way that you can test. We have a per se legal limit in Colorado. Very frankly, some people might meet that per se legal limit and be full on sober and some people might be below it and be full on stoned. It's not easy. It's not a quick breathalyzer where .08 is drunk and we know that. So 60 in January uh, is the number that we have that was just released. I think that's compared to 15 at this time last year. So we are seeing a marked increase in at least arrests for drug to driving. Um, how many more are actually going on out there? I, I, I'm not sure. Ethan, do you uh, have any thoughts, does DPA have any thoughts on whether or not legalization is going to lead to a significant a a increase in drug driving such as that that should weigh against legalizing marijuana? Uh, it's impossible to say. I mean, I don't see any strong evidence or reason to believe it will lead to that. I think as we have greater awareness and understanding about marijuana, its impact on driving and the ways in which it's impacted by use with other drugs. So there are now dozens of studies on marijuana and driving from around the world. And what do we basically find? We find, first of all, that if you're a, an inexperienced marijuana user and you get high, don't drive, right? If you are an experienced marijuana user, but all of a sudden you smoke some stuff that's not the stuff you're used to, do not drive. If you're smoking marijuana, use marijuana, and you're combining it with alcohol or pharmaceutical drugs, benzos, you know, Valium-type drugs, things like that, very dangerous, right? The combination of alcohol and marijuana is a real problem. If you are an experienced marijuana user and you drive, it turns out, first of all, that people, when they drive under the influence of marijuana and they're experienced marijuana user, they're not like drunk drivers. They don't tend to speed. They tend to get in trouble because they're driving too slowly, right? Um, I mean, that's sort of more of the issue there. They, maybe they forget a little bit where they were headed. Um, but it's not that they're swerving lanes, right? The other thing you find is there are a number of studies, including some paid for by the U.S. government, where they looked at experienced marijuana users driving and they were unable to find a distinction between the driving behavior of people, experienced marijuana users driving, and those who were totally straight, right? Which is not the truth. I mean, Ben's right. There are some people who can be over the .08 or whatever and still keep it straight. You learn how to adapt if you're a heavy drinker and you're driving. But by and large, alcohol is much more of a distorting impact. So my real concern is if you see more people who are driving under the influence of marijuana and alcohol. That's the real risk. To the extent there's some substitutability with marijuana, I think we're actually going to see a decline. And in fact, there's an interesting study that was published by the University of Chicago just last year, a guy named Daniel Reese, as I was just looking up on the phone, that actually showed that in the states that had legalized marijuana for medical purposes, you actually saw a decline in driving under the influence fatalities in those states. And they could not prove there was a causal relationship between the, the legalization of medical marijuana and that, but it's interesting that in those states that changed the law to decriminalize or legalize, you saw a drop in fatalities on the road. Interesting. Um, Dean, um, let me put you on the spot again for a second. And in your um, you know, work as a prosecutor in Alaska, you were obviously dealing with um, unique marijuana laws. And I'm just wondering if you came across any information or statistics about whether driving on, with, uh, under the influence of marijuana in Alaska was higher than in other states given the fact that um, adults in Alaska were allowed to use marijuana under limited circumstances. The problem with marijuana and driving is, is that it's hard to test. Uh, even with a even with a blood test, I mean, there's as as has been said, there's no breath test that will measure the amount of marijuana in your system. Even with a blood test, what you end up with is a result that people will say, "Oh gosh, I smoked two days ago. This, you know, I wasn't smoking currently." And the, we know that THC builds up in your fat cells, and that over a period of time, it they it uh, it comes out gradually, and so you're going to have some. You've, if you've smoked recently, you're going to have some amount of marijuana in your blood anyway. So testing for these things is, is really very difficult. There have been other studies that have shown that, that accidents increase. There's a five-fold five increase in accidents with people who test positive for marijuana. 
Does that mean that they were driving under the influence of marijuana or that the marijuana, they had used it a couple days before and, uh, or, or recently enough that they still had some effect? I don't know, it's just too difficult to, to say, but I guess the question is, why take the risk? I mean, there's, there's so many problems with, with marijuana, the amount of dependency, its effect on alcohol treatment, making alcohol treatment more difficult, uh, making mental health treatment more difficult, people having psychotic breaks occur much more frequently. There are so many risks with marijuana, and that's just talking about adults. We haven't even talked about, about kids. Why take the risk? I mean, what, what is there to be gained uh, in taking the risk? Uh, Taylor talked about uh, taxing. Sure, we can, we can tax it a little bit. Colorado's on slate to, to get uh, maybe $100 million in tax revenue this year. But they've got seven times the population. Alaska might get $15 million. What can we do with that? Um, I mean, Ethan talks about you know building new schools and, and improving the education system. What, we're gonna build a couple of classrooms with that amount of money? The, 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 the problem that we have is not gonna be solved by $15 million extra. What we're gonna get is more dependency, more problems with alcohol treatment, more problems with our mental health system, and again, uh, there's, there's wherever marijuana has been made legal or decriminalized, call it whatever you want, even where medical marijuana has, has been allowed in, in states, the rate at which young people use it increases. Uh, I'm not willing to, to, to go down the road that, you know, that, uh, that Ethan wants us to go down, that, that the kids are always gonna get it. They, they may be able to get it, when it's, but when it's legal, when it's out there, when more of it is out there, when there are commercial interests, advertising, making products that appeal to kids, they're gonna use it a lot more. And so somebody asked me about the effect on kids. Okay, so a lot of information in that answer. Um, I'm gonna do a couple, a couple of things. Um, I know Taylor um, had a, wanted to quickly respond um, he, when, um, when there was a comment about driving, so I know Taylor has a point he wants to make about that. Ethan's got a, a point that he wants to make about something. Um, and, and what I wanna do is allow you two to make those two comments quickly, and then we're gonna have to take a 30 second break for some camera maintenance. Um, and then after that, I would like to ask a couple of questions about um, a point that Dean just raised, and that is the effect of marijuana legalization on uh, mental health concerns and on children. I know there are some, we've got some questions about that, and I know there are some people in the crowd that are very interested in those issues. So Taylor, do you wanna respond to your, with the, the driving? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that the driving under the influence of marijuana issue doesn't have a whole lot to do with the ballot initiative. That issue is going to exist regardless of whether or not this initiative passes in August. Uh, we know that Alaskans are using marijuana. Uh, they're using a lot of it. And you know, I'm gonna steal a page out of Ethan's book here. Can you guys raise your hands and tell me if any of you remember the last time that you heard of a violent accident occurring from a marijuana user? How about an alcohol user? Okay, marijuana is in this state. It's being used every single day. And we're not seeing this, um, you know, the sky isn't falling. We're not seeing these, these horrific problems on the roadways. And I think that our, our law enforcement um, professionals are very good. And they, um, again, under prohibition, people are still using it, and it's not a problem. And we have no reason to believe that if prohibition is ended, that all of a sudden this problem is going to come out of thin air because it's something that is not a problem today, and marijuana is being used in this state every day. I think it's important to recognize. Yeah, and I just, um, you know, I was listening to Dean for the first few minutes, and that's very reasonable. Yeah, I, I, and then he just said two things, the first of which, that marijuana legalization will result in an increase in alcohol abuse, for which, as far as I know, there is no empirical evidence. And then he claimed that any state or any jurisdiction that has legalized or decriminalized marijuana has seen an increase in adolescent use. And in fact, that's flat out inaccurate. In fact, what you see is around the country, there are lots, some states where that's true, many places where that's not true. In fact, there, you actually had the government oversampling in states that legalized medical marijuana in the late 90s and not seeing any increase in adolescent use. In fact, it was lower than other states. Then you can look in the Netherlands, which effectively legalized the retail sale of marijuana in the late 70s, and it's had 30 years. And what do you see in the Netherlands? That use went up and down and up and down, more or less at the same rates it did in other Europe 
European countries that did not decriminalize, right? The other thing you see is that rates of marijuana use in the Netherlands are much lower than they are in places like the United States or the United Kingdom, which have very tough marijuana laws. And then you see that the percentage of young people who try marijuana and go on to try harder drugs is lower in the Netherlands than in the US and other countries, in good part because the Dutch separated the market. They separated the soft drug, quote unquote, marijuana market from the other drug. So I just needed to correct, I mean, you're talking about putting information out there, but it's important that there be an empirical basis for this, that we acknowledge where there's conflicting evidence and don't make claims where those claims should not fairly be made. Uh, Dean, Dean or Ben, would you like to respond to Ethan's comments? What I said about, um, what I said was that marijuana use makes alcohol treatment more difficult. Didn't say it increases alcohol abuse. Makes the treatment more difficult. The legislature, our legislature, held hearings in, in 2006 about marijuana and heard, heard evidence from people in the treatment community in, in Alaska that that use of marijuana by people who are alcoholics and, and in treatment makes their recovery from alcoholism much more difficult. That's gonna happen more often. And the last thing we need in Alaska is something that makes alcohol treatment more difficult. That's what I said. The other thing I said was that with respect to those places that have, that have decriminalized marijuana or even made uh, medical marijuana available is that it, it increases the rate at which um, young people uh, use marijuana, and I, you know, I'll stand by that. No, well, you lose. You lose on that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, why don't we take our and quick? I don't think you can oh, come sorry. up with a study to show actually any real strong evidence that jurisdictions that have decriminalized marijuana make it harder for people who are addicted to alcohol to change their problems. I'd like to see that study that's emerged. I'd like. I'd love there, to see the evidence. There was there was testimony in front of the Alaska legislature. I believe by that you can get a person in a drug treatment program needing to say that. I'd love to see any sort of reliable, objective, scientific study actually supporting that kind of claim. Okay. Well. Um, we just heard some comments about alcohol abuse, about treatment, about marijuana making it more difficult um, to, to deal with the problem of, of alcohol. And we have a, I have a number of questions up here that ask about the relationship between marijuana use and alcohol, about mental health treatment, and about the impact that marijuana legalization will have on uh, adolescents. So Ben, maybe you could get us started with this and, and talk a little bit about um, what is happening in, in Colorado and what the arguments are um, or any information that you have about how marijuana legalization impacts mental health concerns. Mental health and youth use or, or just? We keep, we'll just keep them separate for now and they'll come back and talk about adolescent later. Cool. Um, the adolescents are really compelling story. I can't wait to tell you guys that one. Uh, the mental health, yes, there, there's some interesting stuff out there. Dr. Paula Riggs, uh, who's um, on faculty with University of Colorado Hospital, has some real interesting studies. And again, I, I'm going to really in, encourage us. We, we are not speaking theoretically anymore. This is not about other countries. This is not about medicinal stuff in the 90s. Let us tell you what's going on in Colorado because we are several months ahead of where you guys propose to be. So really look to us for where this is headed. I mean, that just makes rational sense. So there is um, an absolutely well-established link, uh, particularly younger, and this is where the conversation gets a little bit, um, it, it's, it's not a quick sound bite. So somebody who has a pre-existing mental health condition, um, their likelihood of having that condition uh, worsened with marijuana use is very real. But it's not something that, uh, oh, so here's your perfect example. Uh, and, and I've heard people, you gotta, so me on this side of it, sometimes I fall in with, uh, with a kind of uh, old school crowd who wants me to gather in and demonize everything. And so I actually heard once, okay, you guys remember that guy in Florida um, last year who attacked the other guy and um, yeah, I, I didn't want to like, went after his face, right? So, so I had somebody send me an email and, and say, um, marijuana was the only substance they found in this body. Isn't that incredible? Marijuana made him do this. Okay, um, no, really more than likely, maybe, and this is <laughs> probably, I haven't seen the guy's medical records, and if I did, 
I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you just what, <laughs> what it would be, but, but what happens is if you have a pre-existing condition, the likelihood that one of those psychotic episodes or psychotic breaks is going to happen to you increases about sixfold with chronic marijuana use. That increase is more significant the younger you start. So maybe a guy like this had a pre-existing mental health condition and something happened. Whether or not it was his drug use, I, I can't. Who can say that? So I think what we need to do is stay away from really intense and kind of demonizing things like that. Again, I've never actually seen reefer madness, but I've heard enough about it. The, the uh, devil weed and the demon weed and, and this will make an army of zombies kind of thing. Um, we need to stay away from that kind of thing, and we do actually need to recognize, again, look into some of this research. It's fascinating stuff. Dr. Paula Riggs, University of Colorado Hospital. Um, there, there is a well-established link between chronic use and uh, mental health issues, particularly psychotic episodes, psychotic break. But again, that's much more likely the younger you start and the more frequently you use. Um, how was that? That's good. But let me ask you a quick follow-up question. So, uh, you know, when you, I hear a lot um, in the, the points that you're taking and the positions you're making about um, the uh, treating you know, looking at addiction and recovery, and I hear those words, and I hear medical issues, and hear public health concerns. And, you know, Sam is taking this position that um, there is a smarter, better way to uh, address marijuana, um, and legalization is not the answer. So could you tell us a little bit about what Sam suggests? What is the approach? Do we just keep the status quo, or is there a, a plan in place that you advocate that will address some of these health concerns that are associated with, with marijuana use? The treatment of addiction, and Ethan, Ethan and I are well aligned on this, that the treatment of addiction belongs squarely within the public health conversation. That's where it traditionally was, it's where it belongs now. Um, what Sam advocates uh, is pretty close to me personally. Uh, l let me tell you guys as, as kind of the guy on the Sam board who they ask questions about addiction to a lot of the times, the non-doctor guy who they ask uh, questions about treatment and recovery. Um, I think it's really important that we do have the opportunity to intervene with people. Uh, I was a good example there. And uh, I had uh, an arrest, an arrest with a possession to intent. Uh, I'm sorry an arrest for possession and an arrest with possession with intent to distribute. Neither one of those interventions ultimately led to my um, getting the help that I needed because I wasn't at the place where I needed it yet. But I know lots of guys who um, did have that intervention and heard something or were told something or were put into a situation where something clicked for them. So again, I will never advocate putting people in jail for the possession of small amounts of marijuana. Not a good thing. I, I don't know many people who would advocate for that. Um, what I do think we've got to maintain the ability to do is to have those brief interventions. In um, Colorado, they call it the ESPERT, the, the screening of brief intervention uh, for treatment. And sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's not. The reality of it is is that some people who present uh, like they might have an issue might just be abusers, might not actually be addicted, or you might have just had a bad weekend. Um, the differentiating between true addiction, abuse, and a rough weekend is an important thing. And let me be super clear here, nobody inside of the business I work in, which is drug treatment, wants to treat people who don't want to be there or who don't belong there. There's a big difference between the addicted user, the recreational user, the, the whatever. The, the reality of what has happened and, and is happening here at home for me is, is that those rates have stayed the same for marijuana use. It's not some crazy thing. It's certainly not the same rates that it is for harder drugs. But, and, and I think we could probably find uh, common ground on this, Ethan, that if you start um, post 18, so if you start smoking weed, I wish everybody would wait till they were 24. If you haven't started smoking weed yet, wait till you're 24. You'll totally, you should be just fine. There shouldn't be an issue with you. But if you start after 18, your odds of developing a clinically diagnosable addiction, so would meet the criteria set forth in the uh, DSM manual, would be about a 1 in 11. If you start pre-18, your odds of developing a clinically diagnosable addiction to the drug would be about a 1 in 6. 
So this isn't my opinion, it's not theory, this is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, the American Medal Medical Association, the smart guys at the table. Um, so it's important to recognize that and, and hopefully respect that while I'm coming here and saying I get that the majority of people who use and smoke and try and experiment will never have an issue with it, it's really important to recognize too that even if this hasn't been your experience, a lot of people who do, that either one in six or one in 11, do end up having an issue with it. And that's my entire sample group, and that sample group is growing back home. So let me, let me just ask you the, this one quick question then. So I, I understand what you're saying, and I understand Sam's position on legalization. You said that um, you don't want to put people in jail for using or possessing small amounts of marijuana. Um, is Sam in favor of decriminalizing marijuana and coming up with a way to treat people who are um, who violate marijuana laws, treating them as having a medical concern or medical issue? Uh, Sam uh, advocates for uh, interventions. So those brief interventions would, of course, be cumulative in nature. They would probably start off with something that was about, um, you know, nothing. Uh, so you get caught the first time and maybe it's a 30-minute uh, a, a thing, maybe it's a conversation with somebody, you get caught the second time, it's probably more of a structured education. And then um, I, I, what happens after that, and, and I'm sorry, you guys, I'm not, and, and I'm not trying to duck this at all, Jason, mm -hmm. you guys might, we might want to ask Kevin uh, about that at Sam or, or look on the website. Okay, thanks. Taylor, do you want to? Yeah, I just, I think it's interesting then hearing you describe Sam's position and then Thinking back to what I heard Patrick Kennedy, who founded your organization, um, and, and Kevin Sabet unveil a few weeks ago, um, and what they talked about um, was, a, was a very different system. And you, you know, you're describing um, treatment, but what you're not mentioning is that you're talking about forced treatment um, at the point of a gun, essentially. Um, Absolutely not. What Sam, Never, what Sam articulated through their principles a few weeks ago was that what they want to see is um, if you get caught with marijuana, you're forced into treatment. And we if you do don't want follow that. through that with the, that treatment, then you're forced into jail. And we again, maybe not. your position is different than what we heard from the organization's leadership recently, um, but that was clearly articulated by Kevin Sabet and, and Patrick Kennedy. It's, this isn't a voluntary thing. Um, and under a system where uh, marijuana was taxed and regulated like alcohol, people would have every right to, treat, to, to send themselves to a treatment facility. And we'd see that happen. We know that marijuana as an intoxicating substance has some potential for abuse, as does nicotine and alcohol and fatty foods. Um, we've seen you know, New York City uh, say that you know, drinking too much soda is bad for you. It causes you to be fat, heart attacks, all these things. So we're, we're not going to let you do that. And, and that doesn't fly in Alaska, this idea that the government is going to regulate otherwise safe behavior because there's some one in eight, one in 11 chance that it could be abused. And I, I think what's important to recognize is that the cases where it is abused are not all that bad. And it's nowhere near the severity of, of alcohol, for example. Absolutely not the and, case. And so we, you know, we, those of us who live here understand the impact that alcohol has on this state. It's ruining communities throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And to suggest that alcohol, which is legal, and which when it's abused, ha kills people, causes domestic violence, rape, murder, uh, car crashes, all of these terrible things, that this substance should be legal. And we're looking at marijuana, which has, in your own words, a one in 12 chance of being abused, and we know um, from every medical study, from public opinion polls that have shown 75% of Americans believe marijuana is safer than alcohol, that in the cases that marijuana is abused, we're not seeing those devastating impacts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this, this idea, it's just, and I think it underscores why the, the support amongst the public is where it is. Um, you no, know, Taylor, I just want to, I just, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt for a minute. I want to ask uh, you know, kick this over to Dean for a second, because as the other Alaskan on the panel who's been working on these issues for a long time, and now um, as a, a, a 
um, no longer currently working for the Department of Law. Maybe Dean can talk a little bit more about his personal perspective on this. Um, I'm just wondering if in your experience, in your career, um, seeing uh, drug and alcohol crimes and the, the extent of them in Alaska, if you have any thoughts on shifting Alaska's criminal penalties for drug and alcohol crimes to more of a treatment model. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to, to Ben to some extent. If, you know, forced treatment often does not work and repeated forced treatment often does not work. When you're talking about uh, true marijuana dependency, um, there are very few treatments that, that work effectively. Um, I, will, I will agree with everyone who says that alcohol is, is the number one problem in Alaska from a criminal justice perspective. But we're taxing and regulating that industry, and that means we're doing a terrible job at it. Nationwide, you know, it's, it's estimated that the amount of tax on alcohol pays for maybe a tenth of, of the problems it causes. And where does the rest fall? It falls on, on state and local agencies from a criminal justice perspective and from a health perspective, who knows, private, private industry and, and maybe now the federal government. You know, we, we haven't done a good job in, in regulating that industry. Why would we want to, or, or the tobacco industry for, the, for that matter, and part of the reason is that those industries, they're big businesses. They've got shareholders that, that they have to answer to. They've, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising to, to get you know, a new generation of, of customers, and they've got lobbyists, and they've got lobbyists working every state legislature and Congress. I mean, our, our country has been giving hundreds of millions of dollars in tobacco subsidies, for God's sakes. So to say that we ought to regulate a, a psychoactive substance like marijuana in the same way as, as these other substances doesn't make any sense to me. Why would we want to have a, a third industry growing up like that? Um, I, will, I, I would favor doubling the alcohol tax in Alaska. I would favor um, making it much more difficult to, uh, for, for alcohol to get into rural villages. I've got some, some ideas along those lines. Um, if you really want to make, make some impacts in Alaska, and particularly in rural Alaska, alcohol is where we need to put our effort. We've been doing it for a long time. There's more that, that can be done. Marijuana is simply not a, prob not a criminal justice problem in Alaska. We don't have mandatory sentencing for, for marijuana like they do in, you know, for some other drug offenses down south, particularly in the federal system. You know, I've looked at marijuana cases, you know, particularly misdemeanor possession cases that, that go through the courts. You see, you see suspended sentence, suspended sentence, suspended sentence. Nothing is happening to people. Every once in a while, though, you'll see somebody does some jail time, and it's because a felony case was plea bargained down to a misdemeanor, and so it looks on paper like a misdemeanor marijuana case, or the person had a long criminal record, or the person was doing other things. Marijuana cases in Alaska are simply not a problem that needs to be addressed. Alcohol needs to be addressed, and I'd support just about anything that uh, we can do to, to make inroads there. Thank you. Um, Lance, we haven't heard from you in a while. So okay. um, I have found a quote in preparing for tonight. I found a quote from you where you said, the war on drugs has made many people lose faith in the integrity of government. Can you explain to us a little bit about what you mean by that? Sure. Uh, when you have programs where you have officers going into the school systems and talking about uh, drugs in an area where they're not necessarily experts, and uh, they're describing things to youngsters, and then time passes, and the kids get out of these programs, and they come up to me years later and say, hey, thanks for that program you uh, had in our school uh, back in, I don't want to show my age here, but let's just say maybe the 80s. <laughs> um, you know, thanks a lot. Everything I learned about drugs, I learned from the program that you did in our school. Uh, and what happens is when they say one thing in the school program and then the kids get out of school, they get to be older, get to be adults, and they find out that everything they learned in that drug program was a lie. Everything was wrong. You know, especially about things like marijuana, that it was the plant with its roots in hell. You know, 
some of that nonsense just doesn't fly, and what happens is they look at this and go, well, they lied to us about marijuana. What else are they lying about? And that's where I question uh, the impact that it has on the integrity of government. That's why I asked that question. You need to understand, I also come at this problem from another perspective, and that's because I'm a fifth generation farmer. And when we get all done here and everybody leaves tonight, you talk about this issue and you've got a lot of decisions to make in Alaska, I would ask you to remember one thing. It's just a plant. Um, you know, well, Len Lance, you know, that, that answer is, is interesting because you voice a certain, you know, d distrust in the way that drug laws have been implemented. Um, and we just received a question that I think kind of flows sort of nicely from that. And, and I'll address this to Ethan. Um, and that question is, what is the hurry to legalize? Shouldn't we wait to see how this works out in other states first? The longer you wait, the longer you persist with the harms and hypocrisies of marijuana prohibition. There's no reason to wait, right? The people in Alaska and around the country now want it to happen. Um, in fact, you know, I'll tell you something. If you ask the deeper question, like, what am I actually fighting for on this whole marijuana thing? It's that a generation from now, and hopefully sooner, people will look back on the marijuana wars and marijuana prohibition of today the same way that today we look back on alcohol prohibition and basically go, what the hell was that all about? Right? I mean, <laughs> that, that is, we're, we're fighting for the day so that our children and grandchildren can grow up and just think that, yeah, marijuana is a psychoactive substance, right? It's not as dangerous as alcohol and cigarettes, but it's problems, and you shouldn't start using it when you're young, and it's a problem. Don't go to work high and don't drive. But, but basically, you guys made a criminal. You actually arrested millions of people for this. You deprived people of access to jobs. You told anybody who ever smoked a joint they couldn't get a job in the military or law enforcement or this or that. They couldn't get licenses. You took people's kids away from them because they smoked marijuana. You know, you put this whole thing. They're going to think, well, people must have been crazy back in the late 20th century. You know? And I'll tell you something else. For those of you here who are Alaskans, you're not just Alaskans, you're Americans. You're part of a national wave and a national transformation of treating marijuana as a criminal market to treating it as a legal market, right? Washington and Colorado stepped out. They stepped out in a big way, and they're doing it right. The only news out of Colorado since they actually set up stores two months ago, it's too, it's too soon to evaluate anything, really. There's only one piece of news out of Colorado since they opened the first marijuana stores 10 weeks ago or nine weeks ago. And you know what that is? That the state government was surprised that tax revenue from legal marijuana sales was twice as high as they expected. That's the only substantive news out of Colorado since they opened those stores. But the fact of the matter, it's important for you to do this in August. It's important for Oregon to do it in November. And it's going to be important for a whole bunch of other states to do it in 2016 because we have to sustain the momentum. Alaska plays a role. This is not just about what Alaska does for Alaskans. This is about sending a message to the rest of the country. It's about providing leadership. And it's about making sure that those people want to roll this thing back and keep marijuana illegal, keep it underground, keep the cops arresting tons of people, right? That's the stuff we have to prevent. That's the role I think you all have to play. Interesting. So, um, Ben, Ethan, Ethan just mentioned the um, surprising tax numbers, I suppose, that, that have come out of Colorado. And uh, we have a, a, a question that asks about whether the economic and social costs of drug use are um, outweighed, or, or do, the, do the social and economic costs of drug use outweigh the benefits that um, taxes uh, the taxes confer, and maybe you can also explain where the, the tax money in Colorado is going and how that plan works. Yes, the answer is yes, they outweigh it, and I'm gonna tell you that, um, but but the, the longer you wait, the more you learn, guys. And what we just heard, what, what I just heard was the importance of Alaska inside of a national strategy, inside of a national movement to, to move legalization um, to this different place inside of America, not about Alaska. 
I'm not hearing the state-specific stuff. I'm not hearing the concern for what's going on. And again, I can tell you what's happening. You're not looking at little numbers that don't matter. You're two days after legalization, two miles up uh, the road from me, a two-year-old girl ate um, a, a cookie and ended up in the ER because you gotta cut them into force because they're so toxic. We have um, THC in, in, infused beverages that have four to a serving because they're so potent. Our butane extracted hash that's produced on this massive industrial scale is 80 to 90% THC. You hot knife it. Anybody else know what else you hot knife? <laughs> You guys, you guys, in, in, in this, my man, and <laughs> in, in, in this was something that was allowed for because of the permissive language inside of our legislation. Let's keep this specific to your legislation. This is something specifically protected inside of your state, leg, uh, in, inside of this legislation. The right for these folks to manufacture on a mass scale this butane extracted hash, it's 80 to 90% THC, man, come on. Now, tax revenues. <laughs> yes, it's actually about $138 million that the governor speculates we'll make over the next 18 months. It's an interesting thing because we have a year's worth of data and an all-cash business. Who's exactly sure what that really means? But let's work, with this, let's work with this dollar figure. We were mandated by Amendment 64, actually a, a vote after Amendment 64 because TABOR, which is Taxpayer Bill of Rights in Colorado, doesn't allow you to mandate anything specifically to one place without um, another popular vote. So the first $40 million of our tax revenue had to go to new school construction Construction, even though the Education Association and the Teachers Union each came out publicly opposed to Amendment 64 and said, we don't want that money, it sends the wrong message to our kids. Well, whatever, they got the money so they can do what they want to with that 40 million when it comes in. Um, that the rest of this money is being spent to clean up the problem. $45.5 million is going to a campaign, a marketing campaign. You guys know much about Colorado at all. You know there's very few media markets there, really only three. We got down south, we're focused on the family rules, everything. We got the Denver market, you got the Western Slope, more or less. We have three media markets. We're going to spend $45 million, according to the governor's bill, to address youth use. That's not little money, that's not a joke. He's taken this $128 million windfall that we've got, that by the way, last week he told all the other governors at their annual meeting, don't go down this road. It's foolish and this money's not really going anywhere, we're spending it all to clean up the mess. $45 million going to the youth uh, prevention campaign, another $40 million going to treatment. Those of us in treatment in Colorado are banding together to sign up to say keep your money. We don't want it. The fact that you're giving us this penance because we're gonna have to clean up the mess that y'all have made, we're not into that. This, the idea that we are going to get this massive windfall, but by the time you do all the math, you take the 40 million, there's about $2 million left that's gonna go into the general fund. So the best analogy I heard from this was, was that this is, yes, there's going to be money coming in, but it's the same thing as stepping in front of a bus so that you can get your insurance money to pay for your medical bills on the back end of it. We wouldn't need that money if we didn't have the, it's, it really comes down to the youth use. Again, I don't care if you get high if you're older than that. It's the youth use. We wouldn't need it if that wasn't just through the roof. And as I continue to hear, we don't have the data, we don't have the number. Oh, we do, and I'll give it to you. And you can ask more questions. I've, I'm rambling now, but I've got it. Well, you know, while we're, we're talking about um, taxes and cost savings and the money involved, I'm wondering if any of the panelists has some insight into what are the criminal justice cost savings with reducing prosecutions um, and enforcement and how much money and time and, and manpower is being spent on that. Maybe uh, Taylor and then, and then Dean could potentially respond to that. Yeah, Jason, I'm actually going to take just a second to respond to something that uh, Mr. Court just said. Um, this isn't about a, a national movement, Ben. Uh, the idea that, you're, that Alaskans don't support this is an insult to the 46,000 people who signed the petition to get this on the ballot. It's an insult to the 55% to 60% of Alaskans who currently support the initiative. And so I think it's unfair, quite frankly, um, for you to come into this state and tell us that this is something we don't want because you're wrong. That's number one. Um, Number two, this idea that because you have a governor who thinks that government is the answer to everything and is spending money that doesn't need to be spent, that doesn't mean it's gonna happen here, okay? 
Um, your governor has decided that you, to take the tax revenue that the state received and that and to pour all that money into government. You're not going to see the same thing in Alaska. The state put together a projection, which quite frankly we believe is high, um, and they're talking about spending maybe three to five million dollars on implementation. We know with out question that the initiative will bring in more tax revenue than that. We also know that it's not all about the tax revenue and the economic benefit of any program can't be measured entirely by the money that's going to into the state coffers in Juneau. We're talking about jobs that are currently being held by criminals, uh, money that's currently benefiting criminal organizations. It's going to be brought above ground. Jobs are going to be created for people that uh, pay taxes the product is going to be sold by taxpaying businesses. And so the whole, you know, this idea that tax revenue is the main thing, that might be important in Colorado, but I, I can guarantee you that Alaskans don't see it that way. So Taylor, what about the, the criminal justice savings? Do you guys have any information or positions on that? We know that there, there will be savings. Um, the state is currently, my understanding is working on um, updating their projections, and I think we expect to see something this summer. Um, but we know that, you know, law enforcement is currently spending money um, going after uh, marijuana um, growers, et cetera, and, and clearly once this initiative is passed and those operations are moved above ground, um, you're not going to have to have the, these big government programs to go after marijuana users. Dean, do you have any thoughts on the, the criminal justice costs of, I guess, keeping marijuana illegal or legalization? As I said before, the marijuana laws are not the problem in Alaska. Uh, the, the law enforcement has a, a lot of priorities. It, it, they do a lot of things in Alaska, and marijuana, marijuana possession cases is not high on the priority list. If they, if they do a traffic stop and you roll down your window and the and a, a smoke pours, a marijuana smoke pours out, they've got to do something but they aren't going after those kinds of cases. Uh, I was talking to somebody from the state troopers and there was recently a federal grant that went to the state troopers and they sent it out to some municipalities to, to deal with, uh, with marijuana growing. They had to give back some of that money because some of the, uh, many of the municipalities are focused on other kinds of drugs. Marijuana enforcement is not a big priority in Alaska unless you are growing it in commercial quantities. Basically, you are pushing an illegal product. Now, if, if anyone thinks that all of those marijuana growers are gonna all of a sudden um, you know, become legal and get licensed and start paying taxes and, and, uh, and sell only to, to regulated retail establishments, I think, I think you're mistaken. That's not the way it, that's not the way it works. Um, in, you know, Ethan talked about uh, you know, Mexican Mexican drug gangs and and drug lords and and uh, you know why are we giving you know billions of dollars to them? Those organizations are going to exist regardless of what we do here in Alaska. A small part of those organizations is is marijuana. Um, it simply is not an issue in Alaska that needs to be uh, that needs to be addressed. So, but. No one's asked me about the effect on kids. I'm going to come to that in just a second. Okay, good. L let me ask you this, though. So if marijuana enforcement is not that big of a deal in Alaska, if we don't have such a huge problem with it, what's wrong with legalizing it? Because, because when something is a crime, it acts as a deterrent to people using it. When, and, there are, and there are studies. There are studies. And look, come on. I, 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 I know... I knew what I knew what kind of audience I was gonna I was gonna get here. People said they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna boo you. They're gonna laugh at you. That's okay. There are there are studies that show that when when your parents disapprove of of marijuana, you're much less likely to use it as a kid. When there are criminal penalties in existence, you're much less u likely to use it. And so the the penalties the the crimes are the legislature's judgment that this isn't something that we want going to our kids, that we want a higher percentage of our kids to use, and it acts as a deterrent. Go ahead and laugh. 
Well, Dean, why don't we use that as a segue? Um, we're, we're running, we're starting to hit the, the point where we're down to about 15 or 20 minutes left. So what I want to do is uh, spend a few minutes talking about marijuana and kids, and we'll let you um, get, get that issue started if you want to make a couple of more points about that. And then we have a stack of questions that are Alaska-specific and about, about the, the, the contours of the um, potential Alaska initiative, and I want to we'll talk, get into that after we talk a little bit about kids. In 2006, the Alaska legislature held hearings on marijuana. Um, the, the main proponents for, uh, for supporting marijuana were the uh, Alaska Civil Liberties Union, and, and Jason was, was working for them as their, as their counsel at the time. They brought, brought in a couple of experts, marijuana experts from down south, you know, college professors, and presented to the Alaska legislatures a lot of legislatures a lot of information. There were hearings in a lot of different committees. These professors had written books, and one of the things they said was, um, "There is uh, an effect on on fetal development in, with pregnant women who use marijuana." Now I heard Ethan say there's nothing like FAS or FAE fetal alcohol syndrome uh, regarding marijuana use. Well, these experts who the ACLU brought in front of the Alaska legislature, they said the opposite. That was in 2006. What they also said at the time was, what we know about adolescent brain development is that the brains keep developing through adolescence and some of the higher brain functions, such as reasoning, memory, um, judgment, uh, are, develop into your late 20s and, or late teens and, and early 20s. And that's why, that's why Ben is saying, if, you know, if you're over 24, and, and uh, you start using marijuana, you know, that's not as much of a problem. But at that time in 2006, what these experts told the legislature was, we don't want kids using it. Kids shouldn't be using it. That was in 2006. Now, recently, we've gotten, that's been quantified. There's, there's been a study that tracked uh, children, measured their IQ from the time they were children into their, into their 30s. And what they found was that those kids who started using marijuana in their early teens used it on a regular basis. There was a measurable drop in their IQs. It was measurable, and it continued uh, to some extent into their 30s. And the amount of, dro of IQ drop, the earlier you started using marijuana, and the more regularly you used it, and I think they, it was you know, several times a week, it, it amounted to eight IQ points. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but let's take the average IQ of 100 in the 50th percentile. You drop eight IQ points, and you've dropped from the 50th percentile to the 29th percentile. That's the kind of measurable information that we've got now. Back in 2006, the exper experts were saying, we don't want kids using it. Now it's measurable. What, what they say is that, that uh, marijuana changes the proportion between the white brain cells and the gray brain cells, and I don't know a lot about that. All I do know is I listen to what the experts say, and there is a definite measurable impact. Um, you know, there is a reason why uh, the, the a coalition of Northwest um, Indian tribes, you know, voted to uh, oppose legalization of marijuana in the Northwest. And part of that is that in, in rural Alaska and with Alaska Native students, they use marijuana at a much higher rate than, uh, than other students in, uh, uh, in the state. I mean, this is a real Alaska problem. It's a real problem in the bush. It's a real problem for Alaska Natives. On, on every measurement, uh, use in the last 30 days, whether you've ever used marijuana, and the most frightening one, you know, how many used marijuana, or how many used marijuana for the first time before the age of 13, the Alaska Natives scored at, on that particular one, double the rate of non-Natives. Now, that is a real significant problem here in Alaska. It's a problem maybe unique to our state. It's why the Native organizations are opposed to marijuana. And, and frankly, it's one of the big failings of this uh, proposed initiative because even though Alaska state law allows villages to make possession of alcohol illegal, I mean, villages can vote to go damp under our local option laws for, for alcohol. They can't, under this initiative, with, with respect to marijuana. They can prohibit marijuana retailers from coming into their, into their village, 
But with respect to marijuana itself, it, people can go outside of the village, buy marijuana, bring it back in, transfer it to somebody else. Uh, it's, it's perfectly legal under this initiative. This, is, this initiative badly fails the Alaska Native population. It's an Alaska-specific problem, and it's, it's a road we shouldn't go down. Ethan, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I just need to respond to you. First of all, Dean, what you're describing about the problems among marijuana use and other drug use, but especially marijuana use among Alaskan Natives um, and young people using, everything you're describing is happening while marijuana is still illegal. I mean, so the notion that legalization is the problem when you have this terrible problem under prohibition, it seems to me is a devastating indictment of prohibition. At the very least, prohibition has failed to protect that population, and who knows if in fact it's exacerbating it. The second thing I'll say is it's very interesting. When you look in those parts of the world, um, where people are too poor to even afford to buy a joint or a hit off a crack pipe or whatever it might be, you know, poor Aboriginal people, poor whatever it might be, what do they do? Are they drug free? No. They're sniffing glue and gasoline and things like that. What's the most devastating thing you can do to the youthful brain or the adult brain in terms of psychoactive substances? It's glue and gasoline and huffing and all this sort of stuff. Now, let me ask you, what's the criminal justice response to huffing and glue and gasoline? There isn't one. There can't be one. How do you make a criminal justice response? But what it does is it points out the futility and absurdity of thinking that you can use the criminal law, the criminal justice system, prosecutors and police to protect vulnerable young people in our society. I'll tell you something else. You know this IQ study that Dean mentioned? It came out of New Zealand a couple of years ago. You know what it actually found? It found that for people who started smoking marijuana at a very young age and continued to do so in a heavy way and then continued on to be heavy marijuana users into adulthood, they found the reduction in IQ. It also suggested that if you were a heavy user of marijuana as an adolescent but stopped as an adult, or conversely, if you didn't use marijuana as an adolescent but were a heavy user as an adult, there was no reduction in the IQ. Then it turned out, subsequent studies came out and were not able to replicate the results of that IQ study, and all sorts of questions were raised about the methodology of it. So do we all agree that young people should not use marijuana? Yes. Do we all agree that it's good to delay the onset of marijuana use? Yes. Do we all agree that if you have mental illness, underlying mental illness, that marijuana, for some people, would help, but for many people, it'll hurt? Yes. But in the end, is that ultimately an argument that says that we need to be arresting hundreds of thousands of people for marijuana and keeping this as an underground market and promoting the hypocrisy of DARE programs and all the other stuff in our society? No, it's not an argument for sustaining the current policy. It's an argument for getting real and pragmatic about how we deal with marijuana in our society. Well, speaking of some real and, and pragmatic things, um, we are starting to, to run out of time, and I want to address a few questions that some people have submitted. And I think this is a real pragmatic um, problem that people who are um, medical marijuana users run into. And this question asks, will legitimate medicinal marijuana patients' insurance cover their medicine? And I guess this is more of a speculative question. And I'd say if, there's, if anyone on the panel wants to offer a um, a guess as to whether we will ever see insurance companies covering medicinal marijuana? Well, I think my short answer to that is that it's never going to happen if prohibition continues. And so it's, there's nothing in the law that's being proposed that, that addresses that directly. Um, but clearly, passing the law would make it easier for that to happen. Um, speaking of um, health concerns and legalization, uh, this question says, I use cannabis to ease my mental health symptoms. I'm also a preschool teacher. If marijuana is legalized, what protections will be in place for people who are in the workforce? And Ben, as someone who um, deals with 
um, mental health and addiction issues in Colorado and as someone from a state where marijuana has been legalized, do you know if this is a problem? What is Colorado doing to address the concerns of people who want to legally use marijuana but their jobs may prohibit it? Well, it's interesting. There's a federal statute um, and, and the right to work uh, statute that the federal government keeps and they kind of trump everything else that says that an employer can't preclude an employee from doing anything legal outside of work hours. So your, your best example there would be a, a pastor who wants to go to the strip club during the week and then comes back. Technically, he can't be punished for that sort of thing. So consumption of, I if this were uh, legal under state law, consumption outside of work hours would be something that under federal law, the employee um, would probably have some protection with. However, there's also the uh, Drug-Free Workplace Act, which says that any time you pop dirty for anything, an employer can, can uh, let you go. And that's not going to change. So you've got two federal policies that are, are kind of have horns locked on that. Um, and there is absolutely not a clean answer to that question. That's a, uh, that is a litigious question. And I try and shy away from those. Well, I'm gonna I'm kicking all the litigious questions to Dean tonight. So, Dean, um, let let, let me um, a ask you this. I uh, the, we have a question that asks about preemption. It says, how would federal preemption affect Alaska state law if marijuana is legalized in Alaska? And earlier tonight, I mentioned um, that the uh, Department of Justice response has said that we're going to allow this experiment to continue in Washington and Colorado, where it has been legalized. And uh, the assumption is that if marijuana is legalized in Alaska and that policy is still in place, that we would fall under the guidance of that decision. So I guess this is a two-part question. And one is um, if, you know, perhaps you could speak to the issue of, um, of preemption and, you know, what concerns we have to worry about if marijuana is legalized in Alaska. And as a matter, uh, as a policy issue, um, are we, do we have to be worried that if marijuana is legalized and people take advantage of changes in the law, that a change in federal administration can then have drastic consequences for um, legal users in Alaska? <laughs> It's been the case for many years that the um, Justice Department here in Alaska, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office, has essentially refused to get involved in um, marijuana cases unless they reached a certain weight threshold, and it used to be 50 pounds or 50 kilos or something. I mean, it was it was an awful, an awful high amount, um, and. I don't see any, any indication that, that that is going to change. In other words, the, that the federal law enforcement perspective here in Alaska is going to change any policies that it's been operating under recently. Um, I think that um, at, the, at the federal level, a change in administration um, is going to revisit this question, and I think it remains to be seen. I mean, if um, if, if Ethan and Taylor are right and there, there are no unintended consequences and everything's just, just coming up roses in all the state, states that have, uh, that have legalized marijuana, I don't think the feds are going to uh, interfere even under a change administration. But um, if I'm right and, that, and if, if Ben is right about uh, some of the effects that have already started to be being seen in, uh, in Colorado and that uh, what I anticipate and that there really are significant uh, effects, then I think a new administration is going to have some different facts to, uh, to consider. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, this person asks, this is the third debate I've been to on this subject. Where are the elected lawmakers? I never see elected lawmakers here at these debates. Um, this is the first such debate that I've ever put together, so I, I can tell you why we don't have anyone on this panel. But I'm curious to hear um, from the panelists if there are elected officials out there, either nationally or in Alaska, who are in favor of and who support legalization. Or is this just too, you know, it's the third rail of politics and they don't like to, to touch it. Lance? My name yeah. is uh, Lance and I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you as sheriff when I get out and just talk to the local groups and of course it's on a much smaller scale this would be about what I'd see at a, the usual budget meeting when people tell me I couldn't have toilet paper for the jail um, you would have uh, debates on this right out in the open and overwhelmingly 
my constituents would tell me to not waste time on marijuana. They simply wanted it taxed and regulated. That's all I can say as someone who's actually been an elected official. Of course, I'm retired now and enjoying it. Thank you very much. If, it, if it's anything like back home, they'll, they'll get involved a little bit closer to the action. I mean, everybody kind of punted and waited to see. And, you know, as politicians, politicians, they want to watch polls and everything. But, um, yeah, my guess is if it's anything like back home, they'll weigh in because everybody back home weighed in, but they waited until the election was a lot closer. That's just a guess. But, but it is notable. I mean, here you have polls across the country showing 55% plus support for legalizing marijuana and barely 40% opposition. But not one member of the U.S. Senate has clearly come out in favor. Some are tiptoeing in that direction. Uh, in the House of Representatives, maybe there are 20, 18 to 20. Uh, among governors, you don't really have a single governor, although the governor of Oregon recently said that he thinks it's inevitable. Uh, among lieutenant governors, there's now one, California, Gavin Newsom. Uh, am among state legislators, it's beginning to change. So I think this is very much an issue on which the people lead and the politicians follow. And the closer they are to Washington, D.C. and Capitol Hill, the longer it'll take for them to get there. You know, uh, Alaska is one of the 24 or 25 states where you have the ballot initiative process. And that means you are in a position to lead. I live in New York. We do not have a ballot initiative process. Right now, we don't even have legal medical marijuana. We have overwhelming support in the assembly. We have a majority of the votes in the state senate. We finally got the governor agreed, but the head of the state senate refuses to put it to a vote. So even when you have overwhelming majority support, the legislators find it really hard to move on this issue. And I think when it comes to the marijuana issue, Many of them are still scared of their own shadow on this issue. In fact, they're not quite to the point of understanding that for many people running for office, this issue can work for them. And I'll just finish by saying the most inspiring case I saw was down in El Paso, Texas. There was a young member of the city council, Beto O'Rourke, who you know, introduced a resolution calling on Congress to look at legalization. And he got shot down by this local congressman. And then he left the city council, wrote a book about why we should legalize marijuana, and then he announced he was going to run for Congress, right? And he ran in the Democratic primary in a heavily Democratic district, but a conservative Democratic district, El Paso, Texas, against the incumbent, who was a former Border Patrol officer, longtime Democratic congressman, and Beto O'Rourke, the young pro-marijuana legalization congressman, beat him and is now a member of Congress. So things are beginning to change. Well, this was um, this question, actually, this is the only question that someone actually put their name on. So Lee, good question. Um, and, and I'll tell you that um, for purposes of this panel, the reason we don't have any elected lawmakers here is that we had five amazing speakers who were willing to come, and we didn't feel that we needed to invite any politicians to that. So, so. So thank you all for coming. Um, we, are, um, we are about out of time, so what I'd like to do though is just to, to wrap things up to, is to give each panelist one final question and give you each about a minute to respond to it. Um, and I think um, what I will do is I will start with, um, with Taylor and we will ask you this question, which is Alaska has tried to legalize it in the past and it has failed. Why will it succeed this time? Uh, because the public opinion has changed really rapidly. Um, the efforts you saw 10 years ago um, were not supported by a majority of Alaskans. They are now. Um, the law that we're talking about now is a lot more reasonable than the efforts that have gone forward in the past. Uh, previously, you had amnesty as a part of the bills. You had a lot more wide open um, legalization structures. What we're talking about doing this time is legalizing marijuana like alcohol in the state. And um, the polls are in our favor. And um, the, the world really has changed on this issue, and it's certainly changed in Alaska. Um, since this is the last question, um, I need to mention a couple things. The first is we do have a website. Um, it's www.regulatemarijuanainalaska.com. Uh, Chris Rempert is uh, the political director for the campaign and has a booth set up um, outside the event, so I'd encourage you all to go grab some materials, uh, register to vote if you aren't already. Um, Final point, uh, the polling shows that this is an issue, uh, it's really a generational divide. 
Uh, 72% of uh, Alaskans ages 18 to 29 support this issue with only 20% opposing it. And so you really have an opportunity in this election to make a difference. Um, and if you all register to vote, get your friends to register to vote, go out and vote, um, you can have a, a major impact. You can help this initiative pass. Um, and I think we'll all be sort of sticking around afterwards. So if you have any questions, you can come find me or, like I said, Chris Rempert in the back. Lance, you've got 60 seconds. What message do you want to give to any law enforcement officials who are out there who are on the fence about legalization? Uh, go to our website, check out the information, leap.cc. Uh, join us, join the effort, join the people who uh, know exactly what we need to do here. Uh, good luck, Alaska. Godspeed with this. I would like you to remember one thing. Think about human history, archaeology. What has it taught us about this? We have had a relationship with this plant for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. The prohibition is what is atypical of our relationship with this plant, okay? And it will go down in history as being an aberration, all right? It's just a plant. God causes the grasses to grow for cattle and the herbs in the service of man. Um, so, Dean, you um, were um, obviously in, in involved, I imagine, in reviewing the um, previous attempts to legalize marijuana, um, whether uh, formally as part of your job or as an individual. Um, so you're familiar with the previous attempts to legalize. Um, this, this bill is a little, or this initiative is a little bit different than the others. Um, but as your summation, can you tell us what is, you know, the, what are the one or two things that you are most concerned about with this initiative? And from what I'm hearing from you today, you're encouraging people, or for, for yourself personally, you would vote against it. What are the one or two things that you think are most troubling about this particular initiative? Sure. Um, there have been attempts uh, to legalize before. They've, they've failed in Alaska. I think what's different is that Washington and Colorado did it. And um, as, as Ben Court says, let's wait and see what happens in those states. Um, I, I will agree that um, we're never going to completely eradicate drugs, as, uh, as Ethan Nadelman says. Um, you know, they're going to be drugs whether we like it or not. But does that mean that we have to have ever stronger drugs, like uh, Ben Court was saying? Uh, does it mean we have to have marijuana that's flavored to appeal to kids? Does it mean that we have to have designer marijuana? Um, those kinds of things are happening in Colorado and they're, and they're real. I think where Ethan Nadelman and I really differ is that he believes that with legalization, there's not gonna be any increase in use. And I believe just the opposite. It's happened in other places. He and I can wrestle, arm wrestle about that afterwards, but it's gonna happen in, it's gonna happen in Colorado. It's gonna happen in Washington. I hope it doesn't happen in Alaska because I hope this ballot measure goes down to defeat. So Ethan, you um, obviously have had the most, the most stage time tonight, and you've talked uh, quite a bit about a, a number of different aspects of marijuana legalization. As a close, can you just tell us what is the absolute core of this issue, especially for Alaska? I know, right? The lesson tonight, know, try to get Ethan Nadelman I mean, to say something in less than 60 seconds. <laughs> I can't speak for Alaska on this. I can speak for myself. And the core is about personal freedom. That's the core. We got Ethan to respond in less than 30 seconds. Great. Uh, ben, we're going to give you, we'll give you the last word on the panel tonight. What is the main takeaway that you want people to leave here with tonight as they consider not just this particular ballot initiative, because whether, if, it, if, it, if it succeeds, we're going to go in one direction. If it fails, it's certainly an issue that will, will pop up again. It's something we're looking at in other states. So what do you want people to know and to take away from this discussion tonight about legalization in Alaska and then legalization more broadly? Let's just consider this initiative right now. I'll, I'll make a comment quickly, I guess, broadly if I can. But 
what this looks like at home, and again, this proposed legislation is even uh, more permissive than what ours is. What this looks like at home is full color ads in the Denver Post with cartoon characters selling weed. It's billboards, it's on buses, it's on taxis. It's um, uh, cartoon, I've got, my phone's just full of it. It's, it's Fred Flintstone with two chicks in bikinis next to him selling it. It's 20% off with student IDs. It's, it's aggressive marketing of something that, um, and I, <laughs> if I, I would have s so much harder of a time taking this stance if I could, if I could sit with Lance on this one, that it is God's herb. I got no issue with God's herb. Yes, George Washington probably smoked at what 0.2 percent THC. We're all guessing. What you've got when it gets industrialized the way that it has at home, and the way that it is planning on being industrialized here, is a THC content of 20 to 30 percent in its smoked <laughs> form, and concentrates that are 80 to 90 percent. Nobody's got a problem with you growing a little bit of weed and smoking it. What we've got a problem with at home is the industry that has sprung up around this and the aggressive marketing um, that they need to sustain that industry. I came from business. What you got to do if you're to, to not grow is to die, they say in business. So you got to get new users and you got to get um, more frequent users. Be careful with this one. Read the language and, and uh, know what you're voting for on this one, guys. Thank you. Well, you know, at the beginning of the evening, I mentioned that uh, marijuana legalization touches on a broad array of topics. There are criminal justice concerns, there are legal concerns, there are mental health matters, there are uh, issues with, with juveniles, there are economic considerations, and then there are the matters of personal freedom and autonomy and federalism and states' rights. This is an issue that is very complicated, and we really just scratched the surface here tonight. And, and I want to actually apologize to the panelists that we could not give more time for everyone to, to explain in further further detail these issues. We could have very easily had a series of these events touching on every one of those topics that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, the constraints um, uh, of time and funding prohibited us from doing that. Um, I, I, work, I, I worked for a while on these issues, and now I do research and study marijuana legalization matters both here and, and nationally, and listening to these experts talk tonight, I learned several things. This is not an easy subject to wrap your minds around. A lot of people came in here tonight with your minds made up one way or the other. Some of you were in the middle. I encourage all of you to really dig into this issue. As, as Ben said, um, it, is, it is not necessarily a black and white issue. There are a lot of shades of green, maybe? <laughs> Um, no, 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 not to, not to joke too much about it, but but this is a really serious issue, and and I think um, so Project Sam has some some materials out there. Leap has some materials. Um, the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol in Alaska has some issues. You can go to the websites for any of these speakers um, and learn a lot more about this issue. It's complicated, it's rich, it's interesting, and it is something that we are um, dealing with right now, not just nationally, but in our state. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I want to thank our panelists for being here. Um, and I guess that's it. People might stick around to answer some more questions. <laughs> <laughs>